It's no secret that the Isle of Man has a rich cultural past. You can see it everywhere you look, and we have plenty of heritage sites you can visit to get a glimpse of the way people used to live. But if you've ever wanted your very own private tour of a castle, considered one of the best examples of a medieval castle in Europe, you've come to the right place. Hi, I'm Siobhan Fletcher, and welcome to this instalment of Island Life. This time, I went on a tour of our ancient capital's very own castle, Castle Russian, with Mark Watterson from Manx National Heritage. We began where any invader worth their salt would, the castle drawbridge. It is a formidable entrance. The portcullis are not original, but you've got two sets. If you were trying to storm the place, the worst scenario is this one would drop down, you would turn to escape perhaps, that one would drop down, and to make matters worse, above us there are three murder holes through which anything could have been thrown. So it's not a surprise, you know, the, the place never fell to force, it yeah. fell to treachery. But let's just imagine we are storming the business. Um, courtyard here, even if you got this far successfully, you're vulnerable, anything could have been thrown down on top of you. I mentioned, you know, it's in a perfect, almost complete state of preservation, completeness. One of the reasons, perhaps the main reason, is in the Victorian period, this was the island's jail. All these black wooden doors around us are the original prison doors. I mean, a castle and a prison, you're just reversing the roles, really. You know, big walls keep people in as effectively as they keep people out. And there's plenty of photographs of the warders standing in front of these prison doors. Prison until 1891, when they built a new prison in Douglas. Now, what we will do is the spiral staircase. There's three floors going up. They're spartan, bleak, rather grim rooms, mostly prisons. We'll stop on one level to see Grunty on the toilet. And then the views are to die for. <laughs> you probably will when we get to the top. <laughs> and then we'll go back through decorated chambers. It's quite spartan. It's a bit you know, black and white going up, but it's more the good life technicolour coming down. So if we've not already died from murder holes, you're going to have us die climbing up all these stairs now? Yes, but the views, the views will be worth <laughs> okay. it if, if you see them before you expire. OK. So just breathe in. If we get to the flag at the top, it's 100 steps from the courtyard. These are the murder holes. Oh, We're on yeah. top of them now. Through which anything, anything could have been thrown. So what sorts of things would they have thrown? I think mainly stones, hot sand apparently, but possibly very rarely boiled oil. You know, we tend to oh. think pour the oil on top. I, I think I'm right in saying that oil would have been quite expensive. Through here, I think. Now, this chap should be grunting. <laughs> oh, he is. It's... So, do you want to explain to my listeners what we're listening to then? <laughs> the, the chap in there is sitting maybe too much information, on a medieval toilet, a garter robe. So we're seeing it in action, <laughs> as it were. Not a lot is being left to the imagination, I admit. Okay. Regarding the, the medieval toilets in the castle, there's one way I remember how many there are, and it's with a limerick, which is as follows. As well as quite wonderful views, there are eight medieval loos. And perish the thought, but if you're caught short, there's one near the shop you can use. <laughs> so good. <laughs> this room is just worth seeing. It's, it's what you see, just various aspects of the castle's past. The fact we've seen some prison cells coming up, I think the most interesting stuff is about the prison period. In particular, when children come, what I like them to do is try the prisoner's bed here. Pretty spartan, pretty basic. But this type of bed was actually introduced after some improvements were embarked on for the prisoners. 
So while it looks grim to us, this was... That's an improvement. Yes, yes, it's the sort of thing I think <laughs> you'll get at a health farm today. It's probably good for you sleeping on this. There are some prison records here, which are... Some of them are rather hard to read. My favourite one here is... If you look at these four men here, this is the 25th of December, Christmas Day, 1835. These men, Killip, Karen, Watterson, put into the castle for riotous and disorderly conduct, and they were released four days later. So obviously just time to cool off. <laughs> this is a, a grim business. Hangman's belt to stop a prisoner on the gallows kicking around or fighting out. The last public execution on the island, or execution hanging here in Castle Russian, was this gentleman, John Kewish. And it was the 150th anniversary this August. He was tried and hung in the castle grounds in the year 1872. Prisoners' menus are rather fun. Uh, the emphasis being on bread, bread, bread and gruel, bread, gruel, bread. Um, so if you liked bread and or gruel, gruel this might be fine. the place to be, it's, you know? Yeah, yeah. Things could be worse. <laughs> also, what's interesting, it's the word they used at the time for the mentally ill. From the 1840s to the 1860s, the castle was a mental asylum. It housed lunatics, which was big business, as it was, I know, certain prisons in London. And if you look at the figures here, I think these are on a par with modern visitor figures. Between July and October 1874, 13,000 adults and nearly 1,000 children visited to see the lunatics. And this fascinating little piece here, the warders tell us it was impossible to prevent visitors from throwing tobacco to the prisoners. It's like some sort of twisted zoo, really, for, yeah, for them back in the day. And this was right through, not as a lunatic asylum, but as a prison, um, until 1891. Then it was Douglas, and obviously more recent times, Jovi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the present governor of the island, Sir John Lorimer, was sworn in, as is nearly always has been the case, here in the castle last autumn. This is a picture of a previous governor being sworn in. The room is still pretty much as you, you see it in photographs. Because we had a little break there where they weren't because that the room was being refurbished, Yeah, wasn't absolutely. It? it was the governor, the prior governor. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it took place in Douglas, the swearing in. So, but yeah. yes, because of the state of the building. But it's back up and running for that function now. Brilliant. And I also think it's worth mentioning, Castle Russian, if you have a £5 note in your pocket, get it out, check it, it's there. And apparently, it's the only banknote known which has a depiction of a pub on it, the Castle Arms, the glue pot, next to the, the fortress. Oh, yeah, just in the little corner there. Yeah, I'll have to check my, check my notes and check if there, you know. <laughs> so it's a little bit windy. I'll talk you in this corner here for my microphone. We're up on the very, very top now of Castle Russian. Can you just tell me a little bit about up here and the view? Well, the views, as you see, unequalled. Looking out to sea, on one side you've got Castle Town Bay, Scarlet Point enclosing it on one side, Lang Ness with its lighthouse on the other, and the prevailing winds, the southwesterlies, come straight in to Castle Town. Looking on the other side, you're looking to South Barule, mm -hmm. the hill, and something I always like to, to mention, it's a nice sort of echo, across the centuries. Um, there is a pre the remains of a prehistoric fortification on South Barul, um, you know, over 2,000 years old, yet we're on this medieval fortification, which in relative terms is quite a newcomer. Also in both world wars, the castle was used as a lookout post. So, you know, the military side protecting the island is a, is a thread that r runs right through this. And you're looking down to the harbour here as well. Lawn House, which we mentioned earlier, the mansion you can see quite clearly in its grounds, and obviously the airport beyond that. You can also see the hills in the centre of the island. A little bit misty today, that direction, but Snaefell can be usually distinguished fairly clearly. So you're seeing, you know, I would think about half the island almost from here. Big question visitors always ask is why they built the castle so close to the airport. <laughs> and it is the Silver Burn River, 
which is about five miles long, that we're at the mouth of here on the castle. Usually castles were built on the coast like this. Obviously, that's a fortification to defend the island, really. But what was the sort of logic? I think really two roles a castle like Castle Rush, and there's the defensive role, as you've mentioned, watching over the surrounding rich farmland in this part of the island. And also, as much as that, it's a symbol of the power of the lords of man, the families who ran and owned the Isle of Man from, you know, sort of early Middle Ages, not long after the Viking period, right down to relatively recent times, the 1700s. The lords of man rarely visited the island themselves, but the castle, just by virtue of being here, was a reminder of their power and a, a symbol of their power. OK, yeah, so far we've seen the grimmer stuff, you know, the grey rooms, mm -hmm. the views are splendid. But on the way down, we're going to see the other side of castle life, private chambers, where the good and the great, when they did visit or stay in the castle, would have used. Mm -hmm. That's where we came in. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you a lovely story. About three weeks ago, a visitor came in, pointed to the well there, and you see the grid on the top, and said, what's that? A trampoline. <laughs> <laughs> I was too slow, I should have come back with, you know, of course any medieval castle worth its salt would have had a trampoline. And how do you think the knights entertained themselves? <laughs> you could have said, you mean you can give it a go, you can jump yes. on it, but I don't know if it would end very well, you know? Okay, Jester. <laughs> <laughs> So obviously, like you said earlier, if we'd tried to storm the castle and we'd made it in this far into yeah. the courtyard below us, anyone up here could probably just throw whatever they want on you and that would be the end of us. Yeah, I mean, even to have got as far, if you were an attacking force as far as the courtyard, you would have done very well. Where the shop is today, that's an outer gatehouse. You would have then had to storm the keep where we saw the portcullis, etc. And then to get into the inner recesses, you're still vulnerable. And again, it's worth repeating, the place never fell to force. Now you got to be honest with me, do you ever pretend you're in something like Game of Thrones and running around protecting the Starks and yes, things? Or? Yeah, there is an element of that. <laughs> or Robin Hood, or pretend yes. you're an archer up here. Oh, yes. It's impossible not to. It'd be I feel like a big kid walking around. Yeah. I want to run around with a I bow and arrow. You have to have a fatal sort of lack of imagination not to slide into that sort of stuff. And you, we do pick up on it when young children, young families visit here. I mean, some of the kids hyperventilate, they run round and they do sell plastic weapons in the shop, axes. Mm. And, you know, you, you feed on that energy. For me, it's a semi-retirement job. But I, I think most of the staff here would agree that, you know, there's a privilege mm -hmm. You're working in a castle. And there's a marvellous phrase we use amongst ourselves. If uh, another staff member says, look, I, I'll be back in 10 minutes, we then can say, OK, I'll hold the fort. <laughs> oh, but um, boom. I'm going to get a little sound effect in there for you on that one. If you look from Castletown Square at the castle, what strikes your eye, amongst other things, is the clock on the outside. In this chamber, we're seeing behind the clock face. It's the innards, it's the workings off the clock. Oh. Let's listen to this. Is everyone okay? <laughs> yeah. That happens on the hour. I'm not an expert, a horologist or anything like that, but pure Heath Robinson is the best way I can describe it. The oldest bits of the clock are part of the, the wooden frame. A lot of the escarpment and the metal bits have re been replaced over the centuries. Traditionally, Elizabeth I gave the clock to the island. That is debatable, perhaps. But if you can see just above the workings, there's a plaque telling us our late queen wound it in 1955. Right in the castle at Castletown.
town boasts a famous one-handed clock presented by Queen Elizabeth I in 1597. Her Majesty, who inspected it closely, was invited to wind it up. We wind it every morning. It's fully, almost fully wound, as you can see at the moment. That was very well timed there, getting us in that for that. Was, yeah, oh, good, that work, good work, good work. That was good uh, work. No, I couldn't have planned that. Yeah, you're right, you get a very good view of the old House of Keys from yep, here. Yeah, the grammar school is hidden um, from where we are at the moment. That was the oldest part of Castletown. Castle came first, then a settlement inevitably follows. And between the castle here and where we see the harbour today, that was the part that developed first. In fact, the grammar school stands in isolation today. Until even as late as the 1950s, there were buildings around it. Right, we can start going down. Very dark. When you come down from the top, the wall walks, the, the ramparts, the battlements, um, even on a day like today, it's pretty bright. So the, the decorated rooms we'll pass through. It takes your eyes just a moment or two to adapt. But it's worth it because from now on, you've got colour, you've got decoration. As I said, it's, it's the good life. And I, I always think a castle, there's something schizophrenic about a castle. It's got to be a big, brutal, strong building to deter people or as an emblem of power. Yet castles were also lived in and used by sophisticated people who wanted the latest fittings and expected a stylish, um, luxurious lifestyle. And that's what we've got on two floors from this point. Up here on the second floor, it's the early Tudor period. And in this room, it's specifically 1507. And it's all about the guy in the middle of the table here, who's the second Earl of Derby. He's the Lord of Man. He owns the island. His family had the island from 1405 right through to the 1700s. But it's his first visit to the island. He's never been here before. He's in his 20s. He's got the good and the great of the island around him. He's got the abbot of Russian Abbey. On the other side, the governor of the island. At the end of the table, you've got the constable, the head of the castle. And he wants you to know who he is. One side here is decorated with his family heraldry his family symbols. On the far wall, you've got his family tree. There's the fellow at the table, father, grandfather. Grandfather played a pivotal role at the famous Battle of Bosworth, the culmination of the War of the Roses, the dynastic struggle, where you've got Richard III being done away with by the forces of Henry Tudor. But because grandfather played an important role at the battle, in fact, if we look over here, at the end of the battle, with Richard dead, tr family tradition has it that grandfather picked up Richard's crown and put it on the head of Henry Tudor. So the guy at the table, the second earl, mm -hmm. the grandson, wants you to know this. Mm -hmm. What a, an illustrious family he belongs to. It's all PR. It's all about him, him, him. Mm -hmm. And as for the food, You've got, it's not an everyday repast, it's, they're pulling all the stops out. Here we've got a mixture of a chicken and a pig, an attempt to make a legendary beast. You see the stitches in the middle? I, I would just like to say that looks like it could be quite disgusting. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> um, not it's so, not looking that appetising to you, me. Well, you certainly wouldn't say that if you'd been invited here <laughs> to the table. If that's not to your taste, you've got peacock coming in right, okay. next to us. So not a lot of options really, I'm not... No. In modern well, terms. Yeah, not a lot of greenery in modern terms. Uh, vegetables, <laughs> greenery, were really for poorer people coming from the ground. A big emphasis on meat. Suckling pig there. <laughs> You've got these what look like donuts, it's bread. They haven't got ceramic plates, they use dry hard, br hard bread, trenches. And the more important you are, the more bits you've got. The Earl has got five the abbot four, the governor three, and the constable two. So it's just stressing the hierarchy of it all.
Yes, yeah. this room, a different flavour to the, the banqueting hall. Um, this is more given over to the decoration, to pleasure rather than propaganda. On this long wall, you've got a decorative scheme, usually referred to as field of a, a thousand flowers. And it's a big conversation piece. Lots of animals, some of them are real, the elephant, some of them are mythical, some are easy to identify, the unicorn there, for example. Um, some of them are slightly more baffling. These creatures are called yales. And there is a story attached to all these different beasts. Educated people at the time, and this is, you know, sort of early 1500s here, would have known the significance of some creatures. Lions were big and proud and brave. Creatures such as bats and stoats, for example, associated with darker, the darker side of things. A hedgehog with fruit on its spikes. They believed hedgehogs rolled over to pick up fruit and the like and carry it home. Dragons, there's a basilisk, a phoenix rising from the flames. So I think the idea would have been people would have eaten a few drinks as well. And just as we're standing looking at these, talking about them, you know, there was... Some of the plants might have been poison, some of them might have been aphrodisiacs. You know, there's all sorts of ways this can be used and enjoyed. Very little by way of seats, which would have been the case. Um, in the past, and even today in royal palaces, at functions, very few people would have been, or still are, important enough to actually sit down. Trunks were ubiquitous, you could use them to sit on. Um, and also, a lot of the decoration, the tapestries around us, would have been rolled up when the important person had moved on and put in a trunk. The trunk would have taken everything to the next venue. We're stressing the guy we've just seen, the second Earl of Derby, Lord of Man. Not all the Lords of Man, by any stretch of the imagination, came to the island. Mm. They had bigger fish to fry, um, the Stanley family, the Earls of Derby, in the UK or the mainland. The strongest room is this one. Okay. Um, in every sense, you can see how thick the walls are. We'll, we'll go into it, especially at the windows. The only access to what would have been the treasury was through these private chambers, so there's an extra layer of security. The goodies, as it were, the, be it money, jewellery, records, would have been kept in this large wall safe. The woodwork is not original, but the, the recesses and the window recesses themselves, as I said, gives you an idea how secure this room actually is. And that means as nice to the best toilet room. I'll let you do this. Okay. We're in a side room here, which might have been used in the medieval period as a bedroom, possibly. It has an ensuite bathroom, mm -hmm. a garderobe. I'll let you come in here, lift the toilet oh, seat, no. right. and I will let you use my torch to look right down there. Oh, let me. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I'm right looking the... down to a very, very, very steep drop, really. <laughs> it's the long drop. It's a very long drop. I mean, yep. I've seen long drops at festivals, they're not that long. <laughs> And so, obviously then, in a toilet like that, it just, presumably, there's no plumbing. It's just going to, this would be a very smelly room to be in. Not necessarily, perhaps, because it is, as we've seen, such a long drop. As I think we mentioned, there's eight of these medieval toilets. They do go down, they, we can trace them to cesspits, and then almost definitely the waste would have... Um, being channeled down to the harbour. Okay, so maybe us. actually not that bad. Maybe not too bad. Okay. okay. Many castles in the Middle Ages had garderobes or toilets, facilities actually jutting over castle walls, so things just went straight out. This is enclosed, um, as we can see, it's en suite. So I would suggest this is quite luxurious living. Again, I am going to say, though, festival long drops isn't a nice smell, so I'm not convinced all the way that it would be smelling of roses, you know? 
This room, just uh, recapping on something I said, um, every room we pass through at some period, or what we refer to as the prison period, the 1800s, was used as a prison cell. In this particular cell, um, there's some fascinating graffiti. From the windows of this room, you could see vessels in the harbour. So once you start looking at the walls, you start seeing sails, oh, wow, yeah. boats of all sorts. Um, there's the bow of a, a ship here. And I've been in here with visitors occasionally. I've just found new vessels. A small one here. Two small ones there, I think, on the wall. And that is possibly the rigging of a boat here. I'm not too sure. There's a small vessel there. Yeah. And I'm sure if you worked at it more, more would come yeah. to light. Yeah, I guess that you say that was your only view really out of the windows is yes. the sea. <laughs> so. Very briefly as we go down this staircase, which is, these are called the prison stairs. These were put in about 200 years ago um, when the castle, by then in a very bad condition, was turned into a prison. The portraits as we go down are of different lords of man, all from the same family, the Stanley family, who, because of family exploits at Bosworth, were given the title Earls of Derby. None of the men we're looking at here ever visited the island. Right, uh, upstairs the decorated rooms, early 1500s, Different flavour in the dining room we're in now. It's set up to look as it might have done in about the year 1700. One of the mannequins, one of the gentlemen depicted here is the ninth Earl of Derby. And so we're up about 200 years on from upstairs and we're one course on. Upstairs they're attacking the main course. Here it's after eight and coffee stage. Lots of sweet things, marzipan, sense of humour as well, marzipan made to look like egg and bacon. There's jelly type treats here. There's fruit, there's cinnamon. There would have been drink, it's not depicted on, on the table. And I'll give you an idea maybe of their sense of humour at the other end of the table. This ceramic piece, a fuddle cup or a fuddling cup, gives us an idea of what might have made them laugh because a host would give an unsuspecting guest these four cups joined together. The guest wouldn't really know that the four cups, which were full of a strong drink, are joined at the bottom. He or she would have been asked just to drink from one of these. And before they realized it, they would have drank all four, which must have been hugely embarrassing. I'm sorry, I seem to have drank the lot. And it would have been a strong drink. It would have had you befuddled, so a fuddle cup or a fuddling cup. The other is usually referred to as a puzzle cup. Again, a guest would have been given this and asked to drink from it or pour it into another cup without realizing that to make it pour smoothly, properly, you'd have to cover some of the holes and then it would work. Otherwise, they would embarrass themselves. It would squirt all over the place. So th these might have had them in stitches. <laughs> the decor here is much more austere than upstairs. They did an inventory of what was in the castle round about 1700 and there were quite a lot of maps, which at the time were obviously fashionable, very expensive. The big one on the wall here is worth looking at in a, just a little bit more detail. It's a copy of a Dutch map from round about 1600, which is sort of halfway between the world we saw upstairs and what we've got here. I'm not a cartographer, but most of it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. A young boy visitor once with his family looked at this and said, oh, it's the big screen in the corner. And it was part of your entertainment. Again, if you'd had a few drinks, um, the host might have shown you where he had travelled himself, um, what his country had taken over, etc. Australia is missing markedly here. This is before Captain Cook. I always say we'd have been higher up the cricket rankings. <laughs> <laughs> and there are two maps from the Isle of Man from the same period, actually. I'll just concentrate on, on this one. Quite a famous map, if you look at any history books about the island, a map by John Speed, early 1600s, will often feature. And I think the geography is familiar enough, you know. We can see where we are, Castletown. The castle itself is marked there. 
It's just the scale of the island on this is big. We seem to fill the whole Irish Sea here. But I do like the idea it's roughly the same as this enormous world map facing it on the other side. And something I think really worth stressing, incidentally, uh, this scene we see of the Ninth Earl dining would not have taken place here in the keep, the middle of the castle. By the 1700s, the keep would have been too dark and dank and old-fashioned. Roughly above where the shop is today is Derby House, built late 15 and through the 1600s. This scene, a scene like this, would have taken place in Derby House. When they visited, they would not at all have used the keep by this period. Quite a haunted room, thank you, this one. Oh, really? Yeah. Have you ever had like ghost no, investigators in? Or? Yes, we have. And I, I must admit, I, I personally don't know too much on that one. Though custodians used to live in the castle, I think until about 30 years ago. I was introduced last year to one of the last people to have been brought up in the castle, a girl who's probably now in her 40s. Now, she told us some stories about growing up here, and they got so used to strange apparitions, you know, they, it became the norm. But as we were leaving the castle, she stopped me on the drawbridge and said there was one more thing she would like to tell me. And she said, pointing to the house, the, the area where she lived, that she used to have a dream that she looked out of her bedroom window and saw a hanging taking place. And she pointed to a specific part of the castle. I went absolutely cold because where she pointed to was exactly where the gallows had stood when the last execution took place here in 1872. I checked with her, you know, she dreamt she saw a hanging. I told her, I said, well, you're pointing to exactly where the gallows stood. We know where everyone stood on that day. To which she just said, oh, really? And <laughs> left. <laughs> I personally was goosebumps. I yeah. just couldn't move, you know. Yeah. Somebody guess... since suggested, well, are you sure she wasn't just having you on? Yeah. No, I don't think so. But if she grew up here, I feel like maybe... Well, she used to walk. say there was, you know, a woman always watching her bed or a sister's mm. bed. She used to see her father walking around the keep here with a person on either side. Lovely room. This functions do take place occasionally in this room. Um, weddings regularly take place here. You can have it laid out in however you want it. But this last big room is given over to one man, the fellow sat at the end, the seventh Earl of Derby, James, sometimes referred to as the Great Stanley. That's him depicted by Van Dyke on the other wall with his feisty French wife, Charlotte one of their children, and he's possibly there, possibly pointing to the Isle of Man. The original of that painting is in the frick in New York. James is well known today for his role in the English Civil War. When the Civil War broke out in 1642, he was an ardent royalist. He fought for Charles I, not too successfully. He retreated here to the Isle of Man and established a royalist court in exile here at Castle Russian. In 1651, he took 300 Manxmen with him to fight for the future Charles II. He was very unsuccessful. He was injured, he was captured, he was tried, he was executed at Bolton. About two weeks after that, Cromwell, Parliament had had enough with the Isle of Man. A fleet was dispatched, landed at Ramsey. Charlotte, James's wife, was ready to fight here at Castle Russian. Unfortunately, the, the Manx garrison, which had been left to protect her and its leader, Ilium Doan, came to an accommodation with the parliamentarian forces, um, whereby they surrendered the island. Ilium Doan believed it was the best thing for the Manx nation. When the parliamentarians came here to the castle, they negotiated with Charlotte. She learnt her husband was dead, wrong-footed her, the garrison let in the parliamentarian forces. So he's known as the Great Stanley, but just about everything he did was madly unsuccessful. <laughs> Thanks again to Mark Watterson from Manx National Heritage for that tour around Castle Russian. 